Vorrei ringraziare eh, l'invito de, de de, del Centro di Studi di Machiavelli per l'invito, per, per anche l'ospitalità qui nella Camera dei Deputati. Uh, distinguished members of the Parliament, distinguished ambassador, your co-panelists, Francesco and the others, dear Martin as well, it's a pleasure to share the floor with an MCC student here. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the, for the invitation. And uh, thank you also for giving the floor indeed to dissident views. I think diversity should be first and foremost, if not only, a matter of intellectual diversity. And also let me tell you uh, something, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear citizens, and ladies and gentlemen, again. Uh, sorry, you might think I am not in, uh, I'm a bit out of my mind, but I just wanted to stress it because uh, last week my former employer, the European Commission, published some internal guidelines for inclusive communications. And the words I just used, citizens and ladies and gentlemen, are words that, are, that my former colleagues are no longer allowed to pronounce in an event. I let you guess why. So that's why I'm also happy here to start my speech again with a very clear and very political ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, Mr. Zich, indeed, for, the, for, for the, your introductory remarks. You said it almost all. And there are a couple of points that I think are maybe worth being stressed here because uh, it will really, really like, you know, uh, bring a bit of serenity and a bit of nuance to this debate. The way you heard about this allegedly Polish-only controversy on primacy, I mean, you said it, the world is complex, even more so the European Union, <laughs> even more so the European Union law. And so here I think we really need, it's not a matter of black and white, it's rather, you know, um, you know the shades of grey. And again, there is room for interpretation, there is room for discussion, and I know that be, disagreeing and discussing is no longer very trendy, but it's definitely something that we have to do, especially in the European Union. So just a couple of points. The first one I wanted to insist again that it's a very old debate. There's nothing new about it. I'm going to elaborate a bit on that. The second point is that it's, not, it's absolutely not only about Poland. Poland is actually came late to this debate <laughs> because this debate is actually much older than I am and much older than most of you in the room, so imagine. Then my third point is that is it really a matter of primacy, or is it a matter of competences? Paraphrasing the very, very well-known uh, sentence of Bill Clinton that everyone paraphrased, by the way, so there's nothing original here, but it's about competences. Stupid. Then I would like also to say a couple of words about the European Court of Justice, you know, because again, uh, the judicial power, of course, it must also be, be subject to analysis and sometimes criticism. And then I also would like to put the, this very specific context, uh, debate in the wider political context of you know, what is going now in the European Union today, especially from an ideological point of view, because it has its influence in the current debate. First of all, let me say that for me, primacy makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. From a legal point of view, without primacy, you wouldn't have European law at all. If member states can change unilaterally on Tuesday what they agreed together in Brussels on Monday, then we would never have laws, no, we would never have any binding effect, and all the interesting European legislation would never you know, come into force. So of course subsidiarity makes sense, but not at any price, and actually, with very two simple conditions. The first one is that it is strictly within the competences of the European Union, and the second one is that it doesn't prime on the European, on the national constitutions. And actually, we could end the debate there. We could end the debate there. I think 95% of the legal scholars, for sure, but even the politicians of good faith or the leaders of good faith could stop it there. So you see, at the end, there's a lot of common ground. And again, this is a very old debate. It's true that it's, it's tiring and sometimes you know, cynical to see the huge outrage that the decision of the, Pol of the Polish Constitutional Court triggered when actually you know, the first time a court says something that was very similar, even in the wording, was the German Constitutional Court in 1970 in their landmark case, Internationale Handelsgesellschaft, that then led to all the Zolange um, uh, case law. 
And the Zolanga case, though, they repeated it in 92 with Maastricht, the Brunner case. And actually, they even repeated it one year ago. So on the 5th of May 2020, the Karlsruhe, so the German Constitutional Court, sent, I wouldn't say a clear sign, I would rather call it a thermonuclear bomb against the primacy of European law. They did that. And they did it with a very serious matter, which is the, uh, you know, like the purchase of bonds of the European Central Bank under the quantitative easing program. So basically, remember, uh, 14 months ago, we were in the middle of the biggest crisis since the war. Uh, we didn't have the recovery funds yet. Europe was facing a huge, a huge economic crisis. And suddenly the German Constitutional Court came with, mm, we are not sure that this program that you have been running for, for 10 years actually respects the limits and the principle of conferral of competences. So we need more information. And if you don't like it, and if you don't think it's proportional, proportional, then we will, we will give the instructions to the European, to the German Central Bank to withdraw from this program. That will end, that will mean basically the end of this program. That will end, that will mean also huge, huge trouble for the Eurozone. And if you want to push the next pessimistic step of my scenario, I let you imagine it. So this is what the German Constitutional Court did for 16 months ago. It was in the news but not to this, with the same virulence you know, as it was with Poland. So there again, I mean, it's, a, it's also maybe also a matter of double standards. And again, Mr. Zich already said it, the Germans, the French, the Spaniards, the Romanians, the Czechs, and so on and so forth. I mean, this discussion on who, what prevails, you, the treaties or national constitutions, it has been there again since at least, at least 1970. And then, what is very striking as well when you read the, the, judge, the judgment of the Polish court and the judgment, the very recent judgment of the German court, I only read the, the summaries of both, sorry, uh, but the wording is very, very similar. In the 5th of May 2020, what the, the German constitutional court said, for example, they spoke about a lack of legitimacy. They spoke about the principle of democracy. They speak about the constant erosion of the competences of the member states. They said that basically the European Court of Justice is not doing well its job. As simple as that. So in terms of virulence, if you go to the main sources, to the direct sources, you find actually, I would say that even the Polish judges were a bit more diplomatic than the German ones. You know? And again, both have the merit, and this is my third point, to put the question on the table, the main question in in, in, from my humble opinion, which is not about primacy, because the, the debate on primacy, as we said five minutes ago, it can be agreed quickly. The question is competences. And competences, I mean, does the EU go beyond its competences or not? And uh, this is for me the one million dollar question. And this is actually in Article 5 that I'm just going to read to you because it's one of the simplest articles in the treaty. Article 5 says in the paragraphs 2, the sentence, the punchline I like the most, competence not conferred upon the union in the treaties remain with the member states. But for a provision of European law, it's pretty clear. It's not very complex. And actually, it gives little room for discussion. And in my humble opinion, I have the impression that this is the elephant in the room of this discussion, and the one that no one dares to speak about. If you hear the European Court of Justice, they never speak about Article 5. They assume that, of course, they respect it, but they never justify themselves. And you can find a lot of examples in their case law that show that actually, you know, with their allegedly teleological interpretation of the treaty, that at the end of the day, what they do, you know, is maybe, maybe infringing this Article 5. Um, you don't hear it in the public uh, communication of Mrs. von der Leyen, for example. What she says in the parliament was everything but Article 5. Actually, her, 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 her speech can be summarized as, oh, dear Polish citizens, I know you are living in a dictatorship, and me, me, the, messi, the Messiah, I'm going to save you from that. That was basically her speech. But, okay, can we, can we go into details? Can we speak about Article 5? What are you doing, Commission, to judge in your impact assessments whether you are respecting Article 5 or not? Huh? Um, there might be a gray zone, fine, but that big, that wide, and that unquestioned gray zone, 
that no one really questioned. Is that really something, you know, that that we can bear with that? And then, you know, from Brussels, we hear, I spoke about it with my former colleagues as well. They say, you know, if you don't like the rules of the game, change the rules of the game. But so far, the rules of the game are that it's for the European Court of Justice to decide. And including to, to decide whether it's an EU competence or not. Even when sometimes, you know, they really run interpretations that are contrary to the text of a directive or to the text of the treaty itself. But my question is, we don't need to change the rules of the, law, of the game. We just simply need to apply them. And Article 5, again, is not only the elephant in the room, it's also the forgotten element, the ghost. No one really dares to speak about it. And that tells a lot also about the current European um, Union and also about the court. And so let me also say a couple of things about the European Court of Justice. Because there are a couple of things, you know, that I would like to stress here in front of you. I think that this court is too lonely too lonely. It doesn't have any court above itself. It doesn't have any courts next to each other, next, next, next to it neither. And you know, actually, when you think that all the EU member states signed to the European Convention of Human Rights, and so as a matter of fact, any constitution, national constitutional law, any sup national Supreme Court basically has Strasbourg ahead of it. You may say that Strasbourg is not a real court. Well, Strasbourg, they do judgments, and then you have also a mechanism to make them compulsory. But the only Supreme Court in the European Union that doesn't look up at anyone is this one, because it refused to join the European Convention of Human Rights. I'm not a big fan of the European Court of Human Rights, but every, the rules are that everyone should sign and should be a member of that. It's in the treaty as well. It's in Article uh, 6 or 8 of the treaty. The Commission negotiated that, and this court... This court is actually saying, no, we won't. Ten years ago, they issued an opinion, eight years ago, I think, saying, no, we're not going to join this one. So I think it's, you know, somehow it's also good that the court has some counterbalancing powers among its, sorry, among its peers, among the other courts. This one doesn't, doesn't. And then I think it's also a court that is a bit supreme, is a bit constitutional, is a bit administrative, too many caps on this court. This court has too many different roles, and at the end, you know, it also brings an extra layer of confusion. Um, so this is definitely uh, also a problem. And um, at the end of the day, who should have the last word on a question of competences? Should it, should it be them and only them? Now that we are speaking about the debate on the future of Europe, uh, that I guess 0.5% of the European population is aware of it, um, but still we have to participate. Let me just give you two concrete suggestions. Would it be possible also to have, like the way now, now the Treaty of Lisbon involves national parliaments, to also involve constitutional courts for matters of competences? You know, to give them a rule, maybe a yellow card, maybe a red card type of, uh, of mechanism, why not? And the second one, what about a reverse preliminary ruling? That when there is a case of competences, it is for the European Court of Justice to ask the Polish or the Spanish or the Hungarian Constitutional Court, and at least to wait for their opinion and to take it on board, you know, when they interpret the law. I think that's, for example, those are two concrete, you know, options that are worth being at least discussed, if indeed it can be discussed because what I really remember from your, from your remarks, uh, Mr. Zich, is that this dogmatic approach to the discussions on the European Union today. And you are either in or out. You are either a federalist or a europhobic. Well, uh, I have more European identities in between, if I can speak like that. I'm, I'm non-binary when it comes to the European Union. And, uh, and that also brings me to the, to, the next, uh, to the next point. I also wanted to put this controversy in the wider political context. I think if we only analyze the law, and if we only stay at the legal level, at the legal layer, we are missing a large part of the debate. You, you insinuated it very clearly. Eh? There is a political context here. You spoke about already, you know, what's going on between Poland and the European Union. Um, and here, several questions. And the first one, you know, when we speak about the independence of the judiciary in, the Europe, in, in Poland, when we speak about the rule of law in Poland, 
You know, I don't know. Let, let's say I will be neutral. But the first question I want to answer is, does Mrs. von der Leyen and does the European Court of Justice have a competence to say whether your national uh, judiciary system is good or bad? And then, you know, I don't find a clear answer. Actually, I find a clear answer, and the clear answer is no. Because the legal base they use is Article 19, Paragraph 1. And this Article 19, Paragraph 1 says that member states should you know, put in place the legal remedies necessary to the, to the good implementation of European law. They, didn't, they don't say anything else. And on that very thin basis, very fragile basis, they just build an uh, exorbitant competence that no one gave them. No one gave them explicitly. And when you read Article 5, that is crystal clear. That also brings an obligation if you want, to have crystal clear and very solid legal basis before you act, before you act. And here, on a very, very volatile legal basis, they just build this absolutely exaggerated competence. So there again, it also makes, I think, my point that here is we're not speaking about primacy, we're speaking about competences. And I'm also, I'm even more worried about it because those who are trying to those who, ar who arrogate themselves the right to tell you whether your judicial system is good or bad are political players. They are political players. The Commission is not neutral. When Mr. Timmermans is meeting uh, Poland, for example, Mr. Timmermans used to be the socialist Spitzenkandidat. The Parliament, the European Parliament, when they launch an Article 7 against Hungary, they are obviously politicized. It's their role, it's their, it's their, it's their DNA to be politicized. There's nothing wrong to, to be politicized except when you want to play the judge. And this is what they're doing as well. And then you may say, yeah, but the European institutions now are very neutral. And this is where I'm actually very worried. When you have an institution like the Commission who is even instructing to, to its civil servant how to greet in public, and uh, another thing that they tell them is that, oh, you can no longer say that, oh, uh, I'm really looking forward to Christmas holidays. Or, oh, work is, a, is very difficult before Christmas. That's another example they give in their guidelines. Because Christmas might be offending. When you reach this level of ideology, definitely you also have the right to have second thoughts about their objectivity. In the last years, especially in the last three years, there is clearly, clearly a growing ideologization of in the European Union, pushed by the European Parliament and uh, very much supported as well by the European Commission. If you go to all the texts of the European, the recent texts of initiatives of the European Com uh, Commission on identity, on minorities, be it racism, be it gender, be it sexual minorities, you will find sentences that come straight, straight from the US. You know? So what we call the woke ideology has been has been totally also, you know, like uh, imported into the European Union. When you hear as well about um, unconscious bias, about that uh, systemic ras racism, about, for example, self-determination of gender without age limits, those are all examples that I took from those initiatives. So at the end here, I also join your point that sometimes we have in the impression that the, the future of the European Union must be imposed not discussed. It must be the most top-down historical enterprise in the last 50 years, basically. And so you have the illuminated elite that is going to show to the rest of the world, you know, to the rest of the poor European uneducated citizens how to behave with that. And also what I think very, what I find very striking as well is that all the points that we said about Poland also resound in the Hungarian debate. For example, on the Hungarian law on the protection of minors. There, the European Commission didn't like this legislation and found a way to open an infringement procedure against Hungary. But the problem is that in, in the field of education, how many competences does the European Union have? Zero. On the content of education, of, uh, of the, on the educational content, it's zero. Look at Article 165 of the treaty. And still, they found other legal bases. They found, you know, they distorted legal bases on the internal market, on the free movement of services, to attack it. Um, how much of a messianism pathology you must suffer from in order to do that? And at the end, if you combine this capacity of twisting the legal bases with the political discretion to trigger them or not, we are very close to something called arbitrariness. And I see it. 
I see it coming. And again, that also fits very well into this new picture of a, Euro a European Union, and especially a parliament and a commission that see themselves more as moral authorities than as political actors. And, they, and I have the impression that the, the, the best legal basis they have to act is their moral, moral superiority. And again, this is uh, in a betrayal and a denial of the origins of the European Union. If Mr. Schuman will wake up today, he will certainly be very, very proud of many, many things. But he will be very worried about it, because in his initial, in the initial project, concepts like cultural diversity, the culture of subsidiarity, how come no one speaks about subsidiarity in the European Union, for example? Very few people. Uh, those are really uh, 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 concepts that were there 70 years ago, but that have been lost in translation in the last 10, 20, 30 years maybe, but especially in the last 10 years. So where are we heading now? To a wall? Because uh, basically we don't respect the origins of the project as it was conceived 70 years ago. I think this is an open question, and I will be happy to give you my answer next time on that.